VCY America presents Crosstalk, a nationwide call-in program discussing issues that have an effect on our families, our communities, our churches, our nation, and our world. Crosstalk, an opportunity for you to voice your concerns for biblical principles. And now live by satellite and around the world on the Internet at vcyamerica.org. Here is today's Crosstalk. And welcome to Crosstalk on VCY America. My name is Jim Schneider, and uh, we are looking forward to the program today, providing you a lot of information that you're not going to be hearing from the mainstream media across this nation. Well, the Occupy Wall Street protests are taking place in various cities all across the country. They've become a hodgepodge of various groups, and the face of these protests, though, have been disenchanted. Left-wing individuals, no real clear message, except that Wall Street needs to be part uh, to part with its wealth. However, as the protests evolve, more nefarious groups have uh, joined into this, and uh, here to discuss the matter with us today is Ted Shubat. Uh, Ted is the son of Walid Shubat, a former Muslim terrorist and PLO member. But Ted has done extensive research on how ideologies like Islam, communism, and Nazism actually find common cause. They come together. They, they coexist with one another and maintains that it is no coincidence that the American Nazi Party, the Communist Party USA, and the Muslim Brotherhood are on the same side of these protests. Uh, Ted is the author of In Satan's Footsteps, co-author of the book For God or for Tyranny. And uh, Ted, we'd like to welcome you here to Crosstalk today. Thanks for having me, sir. Uh, Chad, if you would, tell us about the, the, the multiplicity of these groups that have jumped aboard the Occupy Wall Street bandwagon, uh, protests that are actually taking place all across the country. Uh, give us an idea of these uh, various groups that are coming together. Well, we are seeing uh, an allying uh, between Muslims and uh, Muslim fundamentalists and the uh, leftist, very socialistic Marxist uh, protesters uh, in the in the Occupy uh, protests. For example, we have uh, uh, Wael Gunim, we have Arbawi, we have Ahmed Maher. Uh, these were actually the three uh, are really the three main advisors for the Occupy Wall Street uh, protest, and. Uh, the latter of the three, Ahmed Maher, was actually the one who coordinated or helped coordinate um, the, pro- the Tahir Square protest in Egypt, which we saw not so long ago. And this was really the catalyst for uh, the revolution in Egypt. And they actually, these were the ones who were pushing uh, Sharia law in Egypt. So the same people that we see pushing, that were pushing Sharia in Egypt are the same people pushing and helping the socialists uh, here in the United States. And also, uh, you know, there, there were pictures that were released on the Internet by uh, weaselzippers.com of Muslims praying in the Occupy Wall Street protest. And there was even mm. one, uh, somebody said that the Wall Street protests are becoming more of a mosque now. Wow, that is amazing. Now, you stated leadership of these protests, yet the media wants us to believe that the occupations going on are, are just, you know, common, ordinary people, the, the 99% against corporate America. But there's really a lot more here you're finding. No, there was a man by the name of Shayan Arahi, who was also coordinating the event, the Occupy Orlando protests. And uh, he was actually the lawyer for the parents of Rizka Berry. Now, if you remember correctly, uh, Rizka Berry was a, a Muslim girl who converted to Christianity. And her parents, uh, by, you know, following the tenets of Sharia, wanted the government to force her back to their home. And, as, and if you study Islam, Muhammad said, you know, those who leave the, who leave the religion must die. So to, to force this girl back to her parents would be endangering her life. And this lawyer who works for care, lawyer for care, uh, Shayan Elahi, was representing the parents of Rizka Berry. And now he is coordinating an event at the Occupy Orlando. Now what does this tell us? What does this tell us? Why are Muslims... Uh, allying with the leftists is because the, the liberals are stupid. Is because the socialists are ignorant of Islam. Some people think that le- liberalism and Islam are two different ideologies. This is definitely not the case. We have been seeing time and time again leftists allying with 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 Muslims. Why? Because once you study the ideology of Islam and compare it with the ideology of leftism, you find that both uh, ideologies, once paralleled, are almost one and the same. In that, in many different regions, uh, even in the in the ideas of environmentalism, we have Al Gore learning uh, things from Abdullah Umar Nasif, who is a member of Hamas, who is, who's a contributor to Hamas, and here's Abdullah Umar Nasif 
talking about environmentalism, Islamic environmentalism, how Islam is an environmental religion. And here we have Al Gore referencing him in his book, uh, Earth in the Balance. So, and also in the ideas of, for example, in socialism, we have ideas of Islamic socialism. We have the Ummah, or the Islamic community. And in the Hadith, we find Muhammad talking about the Ummah, the Islamic community, as one human body, everybody working together. There is no individualism. Everybody is fighting for the common cause. Everybody is fighting for the common good. And we, have, we also see it in, as well in the leftist thinker, Razou, who is considered to be the founder of liberalism. And Rizzo compliments Islam in his most famous book, The Social Contract. And yet he condemns Christianity for not being collectivist or universalist enough. Uh, Chad, this, this is amazing because, I mean, what you're saying is that Islam, uh, Sharia, socialism really are all comfortably coexisting with one another. Yes, they coordinate uh, very much the same. This is why we see, for example, um, you know, uh, 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 Think Progress actually did an interview with Ahmed Maher. And what did Maher say? He says, I think, I read to you a quote, he says, I think they must keep demonstrating and keep finding new ways to reach more people, to make great change and great pressure on the government. Now, what change do you think these protesters wish? Just today in the Occupy Oakland protest, we f- there's a video that was re- reported, that was uh, presented by Bill O'Reilly on his website today, showing the protesters uh, in Oakland, raiding a Chase bank, throwing things, throwing uh, the, the property of the bank you know, in the air, uh, screaming and raiding and, and, and just harassing the bank. What kind of people, does, does this look like a civilized group of individuals? Can you compare these people to the Tea Party movement? The Tea Party movement simply doesn't want to be taxed. These people, these, these Occupy, uh, pro, you know, Occupy protest uh, folks, they are, are simply acting like thugs. If you look at the Occupy Oakland protest, I mean, it's, it's very difficult to even get into these protests because of the decrepitness of the people uh, uh, involved in these things. Uh, you know, and, and the, uh, the, um, the, for example, Occupy Seattle, man was arrested for sexual exposure. In Occupy Cleveland, there was a, a handicapped woman who was raped. Hmm. And in Egypt, you know, if you want to compare the two, Wait. Laura Logan of CNN was sexually assaulted. Yeah, do, um, do, you, do you see a correlation between these Occupy events here in the U.S. and what was known as the Arab Spring? Yes, I see a, a correlation, in not just in their ideology, but in their behavior as well. I mean, their behavior is criminal. And, and, the, and the things that they are wishing for, the way they are acting, is reminiscent to the, to the way people were acting in the French Revolution. What was going on in the French Revolution? People were protesting against the government because they wanted a welfare state. And as, as, the, as one of the great profound philosophers of the 20th century, Hilaire Belloc, wrote, he said, or said, um, I must say, he said, how can you have a collectivist government without tyranny? How could you have a, go- a collectivist government without government control? It's impossible to force people to act as one for the state unless you enforce the, the uh, natural spirit of individualism in the people out of the society, out of the, 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 the people, out of the civilization. So it is impossible to have a welfare state without government control. We're talking today with Ted Schubat, and uh, Ted, uh, you mentioned this uh, Occupy Orlando, the protest uh, going on there, and Islamic connections. I mean, it's it's more than just Islamic. We're talking about Muslim Brotherhood, correct? Uh, Well, you're talking about CARE, and CARE has been very much affiliated uh, with the uh, with with terrorists. I'll give you an example. Um, There was a a CARE member, founder actually, Ghassan El Ashi. A uh, 65-year prison sentence for funneling over 12 million dollars to the Holy Land Foundation, which is, which was made by Hamas. Uh, there was another one, uh, Musa Abu Marzouk, former care official, uh, and uh, he was designated by the U.S. government in 1995 as officially a terrorist and Hamas leader. I mean, it can go on and on. Randall Royler, he was a, a CARE's former civil rights coordinator. 2009, sorry, 2004, he, sir, he began serving a 20-year prison sentence for aiding al-Qaeda and the Taliban against American troops. So, yes, this is very, you're, you're dealing with very dangerous people, a very dangerous organization. Um, and the same people that are working in, this, in these protests, they are affiliated with terrorists. 
I mean, I can say the same thing about the people that are, for example, working with uh, the, the protest in Libya, working with the protest in uh, in Tunisia, for example, in the, in uh, Tunisia, you had the Nahada or the Islamic Party. They are very much affiliated with the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, they have a leader by the name of Rashad Ghanoushi, and he is already declaring that Sharia law will be established in Tunisia. And the same thing is going on with Libya, for example. Um, just uh, just yesterday on Sunday, we had Mustafa Abdul Jalil, and he announced that Islamic law will be will be the basic source of Libyan law. So we're dealing with a very dangerous entity, and it is the leftist that are abating, are, are, are uh, appeasing these people. It is the leftists not only appeasing them, but assisting them, assisting them in their pushing of Islamic despotism. And Obama is, is, more, is basically what, what Obama did, what Clinton did, is really, the, they, what they did really was the commencing of the ousting of Gaddafi hasn't, when they had NATO take out uh, the dictator of Libya. Hasn't Obama express solidarity with these protests, the Occupy protests? Yes, and as a matter of fact, he has uh, declared solidarity, uh, not just to that, but also the, pro- the, uh, the revolution in Egypt. Uh, let's not forget, just, uh, just recently, Obama said that he is, he is for the, uh, the revolution, and he is saying already that he believes that the revolution will help lead Libya to a democratic nation. The same revolution that just mowed down these Coptic Christians? Yes, the Egyptian as well as the Libyan. And let's not forget the brutality that these people did against Gaddafi. I mean, it went down all the way to sodomization, sodomizing him before they killed him. Hmm. Uh, It was so brutal. Are you going to tell me that these people are going to be better than Gaddafi? Gaddafi himself uh, did not uh, commit himself such uh, decrepit acts. And yes, he was a dictator. But like we read in Scripture... God chooses governments based on the hearts of the people. And if the people live under a dictatorship, there's a really a reason for it. In that, if you get rid of the dictator, then those people will, com- will, will allow another dictator to rule them, because that's the only government those people understand. The same thing is going on in Egypt. As a matter of fact, ancient e- you're talking about Egypt. They lived under the pharaohs for thousands of years. The pharaohs were all dictators. They were dictators for a reason. As a matter of fact, the hieroglyphs of ancient Egyptian language, there's not a single hieroglyph that represents freedom or liberty. So freedom and liberty is not a universal value, as George Bush so incorrectly stated. It's not a universal value. Liberty and freedom are only meant for those who wish for it. Hmm. And to give democracy to those who wish, for, who wish for despotism, who wish for Sharia law, is very dangerous, and it only gives them the freedom to establish those, uh, those uh, very austere and, and uh, uh, dictatorial uh, systems of government. Ted Schubert is our guest here today on Crosstalk. He has done extensive research on how these uh, ideologies, Islam, uh, communism, Nazism, are actually all finding common cause together. And folks, we're seeing these demonstrations take place right here on U.S. soil, known as Occupy Wall Street. We'll be back in just one minute. You're listening to Crosstalk on the VCY America Network. Genesis with Dr. John Morris, creation scientist with ICR. Dr. Morris, the Bible predicts the coming new heavens and new earth. What will they be like? Chris, the Bible doesn't give us all the detail, but from what it does tell us, we see that it'll be quite different. It'll be completely free of sin and its penalties, pain and death. The universal tendency toward death and decay will be reversed, and eternal life will be the order of the day. There'll be no storms like we know today, nor any harsh conditions of any sort. The Bible says we'll have no need of the sun, for Jesus Christ himself will provide the light that's needed. It'll be perfect in every sense. This present world contains so many imperfections due to sin and its penalty death that God sent his only begotten son to die, to restore to its original created intent. The coming new heavens and new earth will be much analogous to the Garden of Eden, that perfect garden, the one we read about back in Genesis. For a free information packet on creation, please call 1-800-7-GENESIS. You're 
listening to Crosstalk on BCY America. Ted Schubot is our guest here today. You've heard his father, Waleed, several times on the program. Well, Ted is the author of the book, In Satan's Footsteps, and co-author of the book, For God or for Tyranny. Matter of fact, Ted said, My father may be hated by Islamists, but I will be hated by Islamists, neo-Nazis, communists, Mormons, evolutionists, and many liberals. Uh, we're talking today about Occupy Wall Street, and uh, specifically, some of the things that have come forth as far as uh, the Occupy Orlando protest. Uh, Islam occupying Orlando is the question. Folks, uh, these are amazing issues that are going unreported. Ted, over the weekend, we saw Libya have its Liberation Day. And now that Gaddafi is gone, those coming into leadership are insisting, and they're insisting now today, Islamic Sharia will be the basis for their governance. Uh, Do you fear we're going to see this, the same trend, the same Sharia become commonplace in the U.S.? Well, no, I don't think that Sharia will, will ever really full, fully take over the United States. There may be some elements of Sharia mm-hmm. which may um, infiltrate the, the American law, but I, I don't think that Sharia will ever, ever conquer the United States law. Uh, Constitution, Article 6 of the Constitution states that the Constitution will be the law of the land. So I don't think so. Also, the question we must also ask ourselves in the pondering this, uh, in that, you know, if Sharia, if, will Sharia ever you know, uh, take over the United States. Just ask yourself this question. Um, uh, how many women in America are willing to wear a hijab? And you, you say, well, very, very little. Well, that's your answer. Mm-hmm. So because of the culture in the United States, I don't think it'll ever happen. Let's not forget, um, you know, these Islamic nations which have Sharia, it's because the society itself wishes for it. Mm-hmm. Yet we're seeing courts today increasingly quoting from aspects of Sharia to make their judgments. Yes, but it's more so, I would say, in England or France, or mm-hmm. not even really France, England mostly. Uh, England already has Sharia courts. But, uh, you know, we're seeing really Sharia really increase in Egypt and as well as in Libya. As a matter of fact, uh, in, in Egypt, uh, Muslim Brotherhood victoriously is, is, is said that we are expecting 65% of the seats in the parliament. And also in, in, uh, in Libya, we have Abdul Jalil, one of the spokesmen for the for the uh, fundamentalists in in uh, Libya. He says the fighters who achieved victory, both civilians and military, uh, he is praising these people, and he also thanks. Guess what? NATO and the U.S. forces for helping them uh, get rid of Gaddafi. So really, Obama is really at fault. The government in America is also at fault for what's going on what because is- they had NATO do these uh, you know bomb bomb Gaddafi. What is your response to the media's treatment of Occupy Wall Street events? My response to how the media has been treating it? Well, yes. uh, it's very, very typical. Of course, you have the conservatives, such as Bill O'Reilly or Sean Hannity or Michael Savage, who are going against uh, the protest, which is I agree with them. And then you have, typically, you have the left, who is saying, well, these protests are very noble and we really, really like them. For example, we have the San Francisco Chronicle you know, talking positively about uh, about uh, the protests. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's going to be typical. And like anything else, you have good versus evil. Good versus evil. You're going to have the left who supports it and the conservatives who, who don't. Mm-hmm. Um, and that really, is, that really exemplifies what I'm talking about in that why do we see the left supporting the Muslims? Why do we see the Christians going against them? It's the side of evil. Don't forget what Christ said about the devils. How can a devil go against another devil? An empire against itself original, uh, uh, eventually will break down. So the left and the Muslims naturally will ally with one another because of the ideological paralleling that we see between the two belief systems. Uh, even Hitler himself uh, romanticized Islam. Hitler himself envisioned that one day Germany would become a Muslim country. And he even lamented the fact that the French uh, defeated the Muslims in the Battle of Tours. And he says that if the French never defeated the Muslims, Germany would have become an Islamic nation. And that the Arabs, because they are an inferior race to the Aryan, would eventually die because of the harsh weather in Germany. And Germany would have become the ideal, supreme Muslim nation of the world. And he believed that Germany would become the headquarters of Islam. So, you know, when, you, when you're talking about Islam, you're talking about a religion that is, one thing, it's not God. It's not, it's not of God. It's of, it's of the, the devil. It's of, of, it's of Allah. Allah really is 
the devil, if you look at you know, the names of Allah. So for people to worship Allah, Allah in the Quran is called the Lord of Devils. He is called the Lord of Dawn. And what does the Bible say? Lucifer, the Lord of the Dawn. Shahar ben, Halil ben Sahar, Lord of the Dawn, Lord of Daybreak. And this is what the Muslims worship, worship the Dawn. There's many verses in the Quran referring to the dawn, how they come from the sky, how they descend from the earth and possess the Muslims, the souls of the Muslims. So we're dealing with a Luciferian religion here. And when you are dealing with a satanic doctrine, of course you're going to see the leftists uh, ally themselves with this Mm -hmm. faith. Because it's always, they will ally with anything against Christianity. And that is what the Muslim Brotherhood is doing right now. They are allying with their friends. Their friends are the left. And, uh, and will, 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 will there come a time in which, as, should the left be victorious in their adventure here, in their venture, will there be a time that one of these groups will try and take precedence over the other? Will, will, will Islamicism, uh, Islamics try to take control over the socialist mindset or the Nazi mindset? Well, the left, you have to understand, the left will, of course, you know, it's like, for example, we had Mussolini and Hitler allied with each other. And Mussolini and Hitler had ideas that are very similar. But they eventually became enemies. Why? Not because Hitler hated uh, socialism. Not because Hitler hated the ideas of Mussolini. They were two dogs fighting for the same bone, and that is power. But once, when the left sees, for example, that Islam is really against Christianity, they, of course, will ally with them. It's really anything against the cross, hmm. anything against Christianity. If it's against Christianity, they will ally with it uh, when they have the upper hand, of course. But if the left had a chance to, uh, to take full power, with, of course they would, they would take it, no doubt in my mind. But you have to go on, you want to say something? Yeah, I was going to ask an, another question here, and that is the implications here of the Occupy Wall Street movement, whether it be Occupy Wall Street, Orlando, or Madison, wherever. What, what implication do you see here for the 2012 elections? You mean how, how, it, how would it affect it? Right. What, what, what we're seeing take place here through these occupied, uh, the Occupy Wall Street movement, are there any implications you see this movement having right now that they, it will have upon the 2012 elections? Well, it may, uh, disturb, you. It may, it may disturb the average American uh, to the extent that they would rather vote for a Republican. Um, but other than that, you know, I can't tell the future. The United States voter uh, is very uncertain. Uh, when Obama was running, you know, we, people were talking about, well, uh, Bill Ayers, and people were exposing uh, Obama's dark background, but that still didn't stop people from voting him. So, I mean, I can't really tell the future, but what I think is foreshadowed in, in, our, in our time right now is the Islamization of the world. For example, we see Libya, we see uh, Egypt, and we see Tunisia. Now, these countries are already talking about um, adopting what they call the Turkish model, or the, the, uh, what they call, quote-unquote, secular Islam. And the reason why they're choosing this is really because it, it appeals to the average Westerner, the Turkish model, because Turkey, as of now, uh, has adopted certain Western and European traits. Uh, and pretty soon you're going to see the, the, the continual Islamization of Turkey. And Turkey, let's not forget, is the second most powerful country in NATO. So for Turkey to become a full Islamic state, would be very, very dangerous. And that, and, but, but the reason why they are going under the, uh, the radar here is because Turkey has, has adopted this European model. So, it, so they don't really seem fundamentalist, but the fact of the matter is that they are. And Erdogan is already talking about bringing more and more Islamic ideas into the society. For example, the hijab, which was very, very unpopular in Turkey. Uh, not so long ago, but he is trying to popularize it, which is why he's having his wife wear uh, the hijab. So we're seeing more and more of this. So we're seeing Tunisia, we're seeing Egypt, we're seeing uh, Libya, and pretty soon we're going to see more and more of these countries get together. And it's very parallel to what we saw in the French Revolution. What happened in the 18th century? The the revolutionaries said we're going to get rid of the monarchy, and they did. And people here in the United States were saying, well, hallelujah, Jefferson thought this was, was a great thing because monarchies and dictators are all, are all bad and they should be thrown out. And you had people on the conservative side, like Edmund Burke or, Edmund, or Edward Gibbon, who were going against the, the, uh, the revolution. And what happened? They got rid of the monarchy. Everyone thought that was a great thing. 
And then what happened when they got rid of the monarchy is it created a vacuum in the, in the society. People wanted a leader. And who took advantage of that, of that thirst? Who quenched that thirst? It was Napoleon. Napoleon came up and said, I will lead France to become a, a world superpower. And he did. But it's, it's also very similar to what's going on today. We are seeing these revolutions in Egypt, in Libya, uh, in Tunisia, in Syria, and these people are not revolting for their individual countries. The Egyptian most fundamentalists don't care about Egypt. They're not patriots about Egypt. They are patriots for the Ummah, the Islamic nation. So all of these nations, once they become fully Islamic, they will create, create a confederacy and become really puzzle pieces or, or, or building blocks for the Islamic nation. And they will be revolting for the Islamic nation, which, which they're doing right now. And pretty soon they're going to want a leader. Who is going to lead the Islamic nation? Who is going to lead the Ummah to become a world superpower? And pretty soon you're going to see a Messiah-like figure arise, and he will say, I will lead the Ummah to become a superpower. And now if we can trust history, if history is indeed a science, if history is indeed no different than, than, uh, than uh, cause and effect, then that is surely what will take place, eventually. Ted Schubat is our guest here today on Crosstalk. I'd like to open our phone lines here. If you have a question, a comment, uh, you would like to make our number 800-733-9829. That's 800-733-9829. Uh, Ted, tell us about your website. Well, it's tedshubat.com. If you, if you go to the website, there's a lot of articles and essays that I have written and also a lot of videos of debates that I have done in the past, of radio interviews that I've done in the past. So there's, there's a lot of things that um, people who are interested in what I'm saying can go and uh, entertain themselves with. Um, and they can also buy books that I have written. One of them is, the most recent one is called For God or for Tyranny. And it's really about what happens when nations deny God's natural law. And it really shows, it makes the case that there really is only two decisions in this world for mankind. Either you are for God or you are for tyranny. Hmm. There is no other. Because when we find out is that God is the ultimate lawmaker, God is the eternal lawmaker. And because he is eternal, he is predictable. He is certain. His laws and, and, and commandments are engraved in stone, unchangeable, unalterable, unalterable by man. But man's laws are alterable. Man's laws are uncertain. And if man wishes to create his own law, not based on the eternal lawmaker, not, not based on the eternal creator, then what to him is good would be what his emotions tell him, what his own intellect tells him. And man is a, is a very, very unstable creature. And to trust man in making law is very, very dangerous. If you look at all the tyrants of history, whether it be Stalin or Hitler, they were very unstable individuals. And to be under the yoke of an unstable dictator would be like living in the time of the Persian Empire, when just by doing something wrong that angered the, the emperor of Persia could have ended your life. Your, your life stands on a, hair, on a hair or a string. It could fall off any day. But when, you're, when your laws are asserted, when your laws are engraved in stone, that is when you have true freedom and true liberty. Ted Schubat is our guest, and again, folks, the website, tedschubat.com. That's T-E-D-S-H-O-E-B-A-T.com. We're going to take a 60-second break, then come back to your phone calls at 800-733-9829. You're listening to Crosstalk on VCY America. It only takes a quick look around to see that the world is a mess. There is something very sinister happening behind the scenes in the areas of money, politics, and religion in our country today. What's worse, we are not being fully informed by Wall Street or government officials, and most of the media is only repeating what the politicians and bankers tell them. In the book, A Nation in Crisis, authors Larry Bates and Chuck Bates, news executives with IRN USA News, unravel the confusion and unmask the mystery surrounding the institutions controlling our money, our government, and our religions. They also give their thoughts on how one should respond to the demise of the U.S. dollar, declining morality, the muzzling of faith, and the chaos of the culture. The hard-covered book, A Nation in Crisis, is available for a donation of $20 to VCY America, which can be made by calling 1-800-729-9829. Ask for the book, A Nation in Crisis. Again, the number toll-free, 1-800-729-9829.
You're listening to Crosstalk on VCY America. Ted Schubat is our guest here today. Yes, you recognize uh, the last name. Uh, his father, Walid, has been with us on several occasions, but uh, Ted is well informed. He has done extensive research on how these ideologies, Islam, communism, uh, Nazism, actually find common cause together. Uh, he is author of uh, In Satan's Footsteps, the latest book for God or for Tyranny. And uh, for more info, you can go to tedshubat.com. I know that these are uh, also available through the VCY bookstore at one uh, 888 Well, let's uh, get to your phone calls here today to Crosstalk. Let's uh, begin in uh, the state of Wisconsin here. Carolyn, go ahead. You're on the air. I have a question. Um, I read online in regard to Gaddafi about one reason that he was targeted by the United States was uh, his interest in having a uh, different monetary standard, being I think it was called black gold. Are you aware of anything like that, or is there any validity to that? No, I have the understanding that Gaddafi was selling black gold. No, um, he was, based on what I read on the computer, he was interested in uh, changing the currency, the main uh, changing the currency, currency from the dollar to... Uh, I thought it was black gold. Uh, is your speaker aware of anything of that sort? No, I, well, so you're saying Gaddafi was selling black gold? Is black the, gold the, the, the oil? The, yeah, he had, yeah, are you referring to oil caller, to Carolyn? I don't know much more about it. I just was questioning. I know that uh, some people believe in Iraq that one reason we went in there was because of his. Uh, desire to devalue the dollar and, and well, yeah, if that would, the currency. Okay, uh, uh, we'll have you answer that, Ted, but it virtually uh, just about every nation in the world, uh, because of the U.S. economy, is looking to devalue the dollar or to uh, bring change yeah. to our currency. But any, do you see any correlation there, Ted? No, I don't think so. I think... Uh... I think if they wanted to bomb Libya for that, they would have bombed uh, Libya a long time ago. But uh, Obama and you know and and the, the Clinton and his their administration, they they had NATO bomb uh, bomb uh, Libya just for the reason that they really don't like Gaddafi, and they in a way sympathize with the the pro, the, uh, the rioters, the rebels. Mm-hmm. Why? Because Obama really comes from that school of thought. Uh, very reminiscent to the uh, the Students for a Democratic Society, which was uh, well known in the 1960s, uh, in that they they uh, they loved dictator, they loved Pol Pot, they loved Che Guevara, they loved all these rebellious rebellious people. Uh, yes, Gaddafi was a dictator. Yes, was he brutal? Of course, he was brutal. But what kind of government would you suggest other than dictatorship? for that type of country. If you give them democracy, they will simply vote in another dictatorship, uh, one that is Islamic. Well, I, I would rather have a, a mobster-like dictator, like Gaddafi, ruling over than a fundamentalist Islamic dictator who will use his resources in the government, weapons and military and the like, to go against other countries, especially the United States and Israel. So we have to understand, you know, which one do you want? Do you want a secular dictator or do you want an Islamic dictator? And that's the choice that we have to make. I mean, that's the only choice we really have. If you have democracy, you come up with the same thing. Or more. <laughs> Carolyn, you know? thanks for the call. We're going next to Dennis from South Dakota. Dennis, you're on the air. Hello. Go ahead, Dennis. Well, thank you for your uh, guest and his expertise and shared everything with us. That was uh, really educational. And my question was, or my thought was, that all countries in the Middle East were Islamic. All countries are Islamic? Uh, hello, Dennis. Pardon? Dennis, uh, you, you cut out there for a moment. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm on a cell phone. I thought all, co- all countries in the Middle East were Islamic. Yes, they're, they're, they're Muslim, but you know, the, the average individual in these countries, for example, like Jordan or Libya or Egypt, is Muslim. But at the same time, the government is not under Sharia law. The government is under a much more Western-style, kind of intermixed with an Eastern-style way of ruling, which is, um, you know, separation of mosque and state. They don't enforce Islam on the, on people. Mubarak had that had that way of of governing as well. But at the same time, they don't want the Islamic fundamentalists to take away their power, which is why Mubarak was brutal against uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, and he did have torture uh, uh, inflicted on on the members or people who were affiliated with the Muslim Brotherhood, simply for the reason that he knew 
that if those people had too much freedom, they could start a revolt against his state. So we have to understand, yes, the majority of these citizens in these countries are Muslim, but the government is not Sharia. There's a difference. Okay, we lost him there. Thank you for your call here. Good question. To Gulf Shores, Alabama, Jeffrey, you're on the air. Hi, how are you? First and foremost, I'd like to say I'm a Christian. My political ideology leans towards constitutional republicanism, and I am 100% behind the Occupy Wall Street movement. I think it's unfair of you to paint with such a broad brush maligning the people. They don't want a welfare state. They want a fair state. Ted, what do you think? Are, are, you, are you just maligning these people here? Well, I could say the same thing about the Tea Party, sir. The Tea Party also wishes for uh, less taxes and, less, and, and smaller government. But if you look at the behavior of these Occupy Wall Street, I mean, they're raiding banks, sir, in Oakland. They are working with people who are affiliated with Muslim, uh, Muslim Brotherhood. They have Nazis in their uh, in their protests, these people, I mean, show me your friends and I can show you your character. You people. These people are not for peaceful protests, sir. And they also want uh, more government benefits. They want government more involved in giving people uh, handouts. Socialism. And, and any time you want handouts, like I said, any time you want socialism, any time you want the government to socialize anything, you are wishing for government control. There's, it's really impossible. To have collectivist state, to have a, a socialist-like state, uh, without uh, government control, and the Tea Party movement wants less government control, and they are not acting in no way as decrepit uh, as uh, these uh, Occupy uh, Wall Street protesters. Jeffrey, do you have further question? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I do because he pretty much talked over me. I said that I was a constitutional Republican. I have nothing to do with that. Yes, there are some elements in there that are doing things that they should not be doing, but you can't lambast the entire group. There are people in churches doing things you ought not be and doing. Every aberrant behavior that you ascribe to the entire movement, you can find in a church somewhere in this country today. The movement is not about welfare or socialism have, or anything so, like so that. What churches are, are, are allying themselves with neo Nazis? And uh, treating people fairly. You said that our, that countries are run by people who, uh, you know, whatever the, the people will allow to be voted in. What we have in power in this country are criminals. Our banking system is run by criminals who per- perpetrated but, uh, global fraud. Oh, so, okay. So that so that automatically justifies the the horrific behavior that's seen in the Oakland Occupy Oakland, sir. It's rape and sex in the streets. And also, I mean, drugs, using drugs. It seems that these people really want attention and that they are not really involved in, in, uh, in uh, uh, civil debate. They're not uh, interested in civil dispute. They are interested in, in rebellion. If you look at the Occupy Oakland, they have raided the Chase Bank. They are destroying uh, uh, pr- uh, private-owned property. And this is not just one or two individuals, is it, Ted? No, it's the entire crowd. I mean, just just go to BillOReilly.com. dot com. Uh, Bill O'Reilly posted up the video. Uh, so it's it's very it's it's really barbarity, if you ask me. Mm-hmm. And uh, let me ask you this here, Jeffrey, too. How do how do you explain the the linking together of the communism, the 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 Islamic factions that are joining with the Occupy uh, Wall is Street? A Christian and a constitutional republic. Yeah, yeah, we've already got that, Jeffrey. Answer that question, though. And if Christ were here Hello, today, Jeffrey. Jeffrey. I he Jeffrey. Would be out there too. Okay. Jeffrey's got his uh, own thing here. Let's go. Port Huron, Michigan. Harry, you're on the air. Hello, oh, Harry. Yeah, uh, thank you guys very much. Uh, the question I have for Ted is, what is the difference between, you mentioned the secular Islam, Islam and Sharia. Right. Hello? Yes. So what is the difference a- between the two? Yes, what's the mm-hmm. difference between the two? Well, the secular is the supposed secular Islam of Turkey uh, really goes back to uh, Kemal Ataturk uh, after the massacre of the, Ar- of the Armenians. Uh, the Europeans had uh, Turkey implement a new type of government, which, and then they also had a man by the name of Kemal Ataturk, who made a new form of Islamic government, and it was more westernized, so there was more freedom allowed in the society. And what, what Erdogan is doing is he's, he has configured something called the Turkish model uh, in that it's like, uh, it's, it's supposedly a Muslim one, but it's more supposedly a moderate Muslim one. But uh, if you look at it, it's not very moderate at all. It's only really a, 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 mask, a mask, 
what, what Erdogan is doing is he's masquerading what uh, his true intentions are with this uh, cliche of Western uh, um, Islam. So it's really um, a farce, if you ask me, because if you look at his actions, for example, he is trying to push Cyprus to give them the, to give uh, him oil to give his country oil. So they discovered oil in Cyprus, and Turkey is now saying, "Well, we we own Cyprus. Cyprus should give us that oil." Or, for example, they are um, they are uh, aiding uh, the the uh, the rioters, the uh, <clears throat> the people who you know all those leftists. If you don't remember, uh, who go who went on those ships, went into Israel, starting riots, supporting the terrorists, wanting to get into Gaza, and they are aiding and abetting those people. So. His actions speak louder than his words. He says that he is for of a secular Muslim society, but that's impossible. That's like saying, I want a capitalist communist government. Does that make any sense? No. So you can't have one and the other. It's either an Islamic government or it's secular. Thank you, Harry, for your call. Our telephone number to Crosstalk, 800-733-9829, 1-800-733-9829. Anthony is next in Milwaukee. You're on the air. Uh, thank you for taking my call. Uh, I'd like to ask your guest, uh, uh, Hillary Clinton. Uh, I always see her on CNN uh, with uh, some of the uh, Muslim delegates and representatives, and I always thought that uh, women were second-class citizens. Um, does she? I mean, uh, does she wield a lot of power with with them over there, or is this just a masquerade? And I'll listen. And uh, thank you for the call. Okay. Well, you know, my father recently exposed Hillary Clinton, uh, one of her uh, main advisors, if not her, if not the main advisor of Hillary Clinton, was Huma Abedin, mm-hmm. who is very much affiliated with what they call the sisterhood, which is the female, uh, you know, the female section or part of the Muslim Brotherhood. So Hillary Clinton does deal with Muslims. Uh, the fact of the matter, the fact that uh, Muslims see women as, you know, inferior to men, that is true. But at the same time, like Malcolm X said, any means necessary to get what you want. And if that is working with Hillary Clinton, then they'll do it. Any, any way they can get, in, they can get uh, influence in the United States government. Uh, you know, it's very, it's a very, Islam is a very Machiavellian system. It has these morals that it, that it supposedly follows, but at the same time, uh, to wish anything or to, uh, to attain what you want, to attain whatever power you wish, you do what you have to do. And if that's breaking the rules, then so be it. Our telephone number to cross talk 800 733 9829. Dave in Milwaukee, you're on the air. Yes, um, I just want to make a comment. I don't understand why. The United States government is um, spending so much of our money to install radical Islam throughout the entire Middle East and giving um, the Sharia law Muslims, the Muslim Brotherhood, control all the oil in the Middle East to have all the money to really terrorize us. I just don't understand it. Uh, to tell you what, we're going to have Ted answer that on the other side of the break, which we are just a couple seconds away. Thanks for your call. We'll have him respond to that as far as the U.S. funding these uh, types of measures. You're listening to Crosstalk on the VCY American Network. Our call in line, 800-733-9829. For the Worldview Weekend Minute, I'm Brandon House. Our website's worldviewweekend.com. As many of you know, Governor Perry and many pro-family leaders united together in a prayer event in August of 2010. One of the groups that was involved was IHOP and Mike Bickle. IHOP stands for International House of Prayer, and it's out of Kansas City. I tried warning many of the evangelical and pro-family leaders that the group IHOP does not embrace what I believe is biblical Christianity. In fact, on their own website, in the IHOP bookstore, they're promoting and selling a book called Fire Within, St. Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross, and the Gospel on Prayer. The book was written by a Catholic priest. St. Teresa of Avila promoted contemplative prayer in the mid-1500s. In her fourth stage of prayer, she was often seen levitating up off the floor. Inside the bookstore, we read where Mike Bickle says, quote, I want this book to be the manual for IHOP KC, end quote. Perhaps pro-family and evangelical leaders will now realize they were helping, I believe, to promote a man whose ministry embraces mysticism.
You're listening to Crosstalk on VCY America. Our guest today is Ted Schubat, uh, one who's done extensive research on the ideologies of Islam, communism, Nazism. They're finding their common cause together here and uh, manifested right before our very eyes in many of the Occupy Wall Street activities taking place across the nation. Uh, Ted, the call that we had just before the break was referencing the U.S. funding of the advancement of Islam, basically. Right. Uh, your response to that? Well, it's a very, uh, it's a very in-depth question. It's very in-depth. That in, in deserves an in-depth answer. Uh, we had George Bush. Let's not forget. Got rid of Saddam Hussein. He didn't get rid of Saddam Hussein because he was a dictator. He really got rid of Saddam Hussein because, uh, you know, the Arabs needed Saddam Hussein gone because they were scared to death of him. Um, so there's a lot of politics involved, and I believe the the main issue, the main source of all these problems, is that many politicians uh, have wished for power not for the sake of patriotism, but for the sake of their own indulgences, the sake of their own name and their own um, eminence in, in, his, in, in society. So by doing so, they have really sold their souls to the devil uh, in that they would get rid of uh, Saddam Hussein simply for the sake of, of you know, securing uh, 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 political uh, con- uh, connections with other countries, for example, Saudi Arabia, and Saddam Hussein, though he was a dictator, now that he is gone, um, now and now that the troops are leaving, what's going to happen is you're going to see Iran, uh, you know, go against, or sorry, come over and, and take over Iraq and become a, a, a superpower in the Near East. Uh, the same thing goes on with with uh, Bill Clinton, for example. Why why did he bomb Serbia? Why did he bomb Serbia and not go against the, the Albanian Muslims who were massacring the Christians of Serbia? But he went against the Christians. So it's, it's not just, it's not only political advancement, but it is also uh, the, the, the mindset of these people. Let's not forget, Obama comes from that radical 1960s mindset, in that Che Guevara was good, in that Pol Pot was good, in that Mao Zedong was good, Lenin was great, uh, that's, uh, Castro was great, Fidel Castro was great. So by that, by that sympathy with the dictators, they therefore have a sympathy with the devil. And they would not mind uh, throwing aside patriotism for the sake of, of standing uh, and assisting those revolutionaries because they have a very similar mindset. That's one thing we have to remember as well. Dave is calling next from New Berlin. You're on the air, Dave. Uh, yes, uh, I was. Thank you for your program. And I was channel surfing yesterday. I think it was public broadcasting uh, on TV that they were talking about the Mennonite Church working together with the Muslims, making quilts together, eating together, raising their children together, and other denominations too. And I'm wondering what's so wrong with that? Because we're trying to the Christians are trying to convert the Muslims, and the Muslims are trying to convert the Christians. <laughs> Who's going to win? You know. Well, you we have to understand is that. In Islam, they are taught from a very young age, and my father can, can, can witness this himself, uh, that, that Christianity uh, is an inferior religion, and that Christians must, would be treated inferiorly in the Islamic society, in the Islamic utopia. For, for, so for a Christian to say, well, we're going to go and make peace with these people, but they don't want peace with you. That's what people need to understand. It's, uh, Muhammad, the prophet himself, destroyed any image which looked like a cross destroyed any, any image which looked like a cross. And there was even a statistic that was shown. 85% of mosques in America teach uh, extremism. So we have to understand what we're dealing with here. And plus, the Mennonite Church, uh, there's also a lot of corruption in there. The Mennonite Church has been known to, been anti, to be anti-Israel. So for the Mennonites to be working, to, you know, to be hanging out with Muslims and talking about how loving, loving Islam is, doesn't surprise me. Uh, we find the same thing going on with the emergent church. Uh, Rick Warren, though he professes to be a Southern Baptist, does not follow the traditions of being a Southern Baptist because he even made an agreement that Islam is a peaceful religion, that Muslims worship a God of love just like Christians worship a God of love. This is not evangelizing. Paul never... Um, put his faith on the line. He never threw away or, 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 or uh, nullified his faith for the sake of pleasing pagan people. Mm-hmm. He always professed to be proud of his faith. 
And that is the problem with people today. They are not proud of their faith, and they never stop recounting the Crusades, the Inquisition, and the Conquistadors. And they say, well, because of these events, we must always keep apologizing and apologizing to the Muslims and keep appeasing them. Well, you know what? Appeasing doesn't work with somebody who doesn't like you and who doesn't, you know, doesn't wish to see you free. Um, Islam, yes, profess Christianity to the Muslims, but do not compliment their religion. Let's, do not say that their religion is connected with your own. Let's go to our final call today from Wisconsin. Ty, you're on the air. Hi, yes, thank you. Um, as far as just Occupy Wall Street, I think we need an Occupy Washington, Occupy the White House. But the two questions I kind of have are, um, isn't Obama kind of a Trojan horse for these two ideologies and bringing about one world government, currency and religion and all that? And then my other question is, is are these two ideologies, how do you see them factoring into Armageddon, or do they? Okay, well, I don't believe in occupying Washington. I believe in conducting, our, as, as a Christian, I believe in conducting myself civilly, and I don't believe in uh, raiding anything. Uh, as far as uh, his, his second comment was, um, uh, what was the second uh, comment? I'm sorry. In regard to uh, heading toward Armageddon, I believe. Uh, heading into Armageddon. Well, the, you know, if you look at the Bible, all of the countries which God destroys literally are today Muslim, whether it be Babylon, Egypt, Edom, which is Jordan, um, Yemen, Southern Arabia, Dedan, which is Arabia, um, also Ethiopia, Kush, Kush would be modern-day Somalia or, um, or Sudan. Um, you know, may, these countries are predominantly Islamic. So I do say, you know, also Persia as well. We see Iran coming on the rise, uniting with or trying to, or about, you know, considering to conquer Iraq. And if that, and if that happens, you'll see Iran becoming a world superpower. Let's not forget Magog and Meshech and Tubal. These are all Turkey. Magog and Meshech, you know, parts of Syria and Turkey. And Turkey used to be a, the same country with Syria. So you're talking about a Turkic people. Well, Turkey, you know, that includes Magog as well. That, well, that is Magog, in fact. So, yes, I do believe the Muslims uh, will be involved in Armageddon. Most certainly, yes. Uh, Ted, uh, we're down to just a few seconds. If you would, again, share your web address and how our listeners can be in contact with you. Well, the website is tedshubat.com, and the book is For God or for Tyranny. Very good. Well, Ted, thank you for being with us, and by all means, give greetings to your father from us. Yes, sir. Thanks for having me. Ted Shubat has been our guest here today on Crosstalk and extensive information and research here on Occupy Wall Street and certainly to look at the ideologies that are all linking together for that common cause. And, uh, folks, we appreciate you joining us. Tell a friend about Crosstalk here on VCY America. Have a good afternoon. Afternoon. You've been listening to Crosstalk via satellite and the Internet from VCY America. Views expressed may or may not be those of this station. For a CD of today's program, send a donation of $6 or more to VCY Tape Ministry, 3434 West Kilbourne Avenue, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 53208, or download by RSS or podcast from CrosstalkAmerica.com. And join us again for Crosstalk.